it answers uh, real soon. But first, I, wanna, I said I'd go through this uh, Iran comprehensive agreement because it's really changed a lot of things in the region. And I'll tell you why it's changed with our allies out there. There are five threats from Iran. One of them was a latent nuclear threat, and that's what we addressed in the Joint Comprehensive Agreement. But in addressing that, we allowed the adversary, in this case, to get relief from sanctions in four other areas, ballistic missiles, terrorism, cyber, and uh, maritime, counter-maritime uh, efforts to interrupt the, uh, the lines of communication in the Gulf. So what we did was for the nations that are closest to Iran, we basically said, we're going to relieve you of sanctions for all of these things, and you've got to live with it, and we are going to get the advantage that they won't go nuclear soon, we think. That was very unsettling. It was very unsettling for Arab allies. It was very unsettling for Turkey in some areas. It was unsettling for the, uh, for the Israelis. And you don't find many issues where you find all of those people in the same position looking at this. Where arms agreements are generally to increase stability, you have noticed uh, some of they called our Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of Reassurance was sent in to tell them we will send, sell you more arms now to the Arab countries in Israel. That's a pretty clear indication that it's not necessarily a more stable environment when the Americans sign it and say we'll sell you more guns as a result to deal with what's going to come out of this. So you have to look at this, ladies and gentlemen, and recognize it is not, for all of its title, comprehensive. Now, I would tell you I've read it twice, and it's clearly written with the idea that Iran is going to cheat. I went back and looked at the agreement the Clinton administration made with North Korea. It's four pages long. There is not a single verification issue in the four pages. Then you read the one on Iran, I think it's 156 or something pages long. For, uh, for you young folks, make sure you read this stuff. Don't take what other people tell you about it. Just pick it up and read it. It's not that intimidating because a lot of the pages are just lists of people that are being relieved of sanctions. You know, not that big a deal. But bottom line is when you read it, it looks like everything's about, we know you're going to cheat and here's how we're going to catch you. So I think where we're at right now is we are going to have to recognize that Iran got out from underneath a pretty onerous set of economic sanctions. And for all the U.S. Congress talking about whether or not they'll support it or not, if the Americans walk away from this, they'll walk away alone. That's the bottom line. There is no walking away from it. Under our system of government, the president can sign up for something like this, wise or unwise, whatever, it's going to happen. So what we need to do, I think, ladies and gentlemen, is have uh, basically two lines of effort. One is on the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy folks who are going to monitor them. We've got to make certain that from from France and Japan, from Australia and Canada, from all the countries that have nuclear physicists and all, that the IAEA is fully staffed and all of us keep our spies watching very closely to make certain that it is verifiable that they are in fact not going for a nuclear weapon. It can work. It's going to be difficult because they have used denial and deceit many times over many years to deny that this program was going on. It was not a nuclear program. It was a nuclear weapons program. We have no doubt about that. On the other hand, we're going to have to address those four other elements. In other words, if they have ballistic missiles, we're going to have to help the GCC, and the GCC are these countries right in this area here. Saudi Arabia is first, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Oman, this is it right here. Plus we're going to have to somehow incorporate Israel, Egypt, and Jordan into an integrated air and missile defense. Because if they start launching ballistic missiles, uh, there's going to be a lot of innocent people die out there. Uh, this will be worse than uh, any bombing campaign you've seen. The second thing is we're going to have to have a cyber monitoring center. Uh, their cyber folks are, they're like children uh, juggling with light bulbs full of nitroglycerin. One of these times they're going to drop one of these things, they're going to turn out the lights in Paris or they're going to turn off the London Stock Exchange or something 
and political leaders will be forced to act. They have done some really uh, crazy things, and right now we think they've been under restrictions because uh, they didn't want the, the, uh, the agreement to go off track, so that in Tehran they kept them under control. Uh, there's another element, and that is the maritime element, and I think we need to increase using the U.S. Fifth Fleet and build up a stronger coalition allied fleet out there to make certain that if they do try to interdict the lines of communication uh, that the world depends on, that we're ready to help. Uh, and this is not where the Americans need the oil. As you know, we are very quickly becoming energy independent right now, but the world economy uh, there are nations from uh, the Pacific, China, India, there are Europe, they need that oil and we've got to keep those lines of communication open. And uh, the last one is uh, we've got to have a counterterrorism campaign. These are people who without a nuclear weapon uh, went and murdered Israeli tourists in Bulgaria a few years ago. They went down to Mexico, they enlisted a drug cartel and they had a plan to kill the Saudi Arabian ambassador two miles from the White House in Washington, D.C. With a, with a truck bomb. And they're going to do it on a Saturday night. And if any of you have been in Georgetown, that's where the restaurant was, you can imagine the carnage that would have been there. Uh, absent one fundamental mistake, they would have pulled it off. They made one fundamental mistake, and uh, that tripped them up. I've seen the intelligence. This was not a rogue intelligence officer who decided to go do something funny. This was approved at the highest levels. They were going to murder an ambassador. And to those of us in the military, we look at ambassadors as men and women of peace. They're, they're almost sacred. You don't touch an ambassador. And they were going to murder that ambassador in downtown Washington, D.C. It gives you an idea that you're dealing with a country here that's not really a country. They're really a revolutionary cause, and they are subject to doing some really crazy things. So we're going to have to have some way of stabilizing and moderating their, their misbehavior or something very bad is going to go on. I think that you can make it work, uh, this, op this uh, agreement work. I don't think our negotiators could have done any better. I think after the Americans blinked when Assad used chemical weapons in Syria and we did not do anything about it, they decided the Americans weren't, did no, no longer had the stomach for another fight. Uh, and so at that point, uh, I, I think we were in a position where our negotiators basically got about as good a, a deal as they could have come up with in this case.